Good evening, everyone. We'll make a start. And good evening to those who are here and to those who are online. My name is Margaret Nichols, and I'm currently the chair of the National of the Friends of the National Library Committee. To start, I would like to acknowledge the Nambri and Ngunnawal people as the custodians of the land that we are meeting on. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and through them to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples. Well, we are in for a treat this evening. The friends are delighted that Julie Ryder has accepted our request to address members at this forum. By the number of subscribers, I think that Julie's creativity is well known and admired by many. Julie is a Canberra-based textile designer, artist and educator. Her background training includes in science, textile design at the Melbourne Institute of Textiles and a Master of Arts at ANU. It is clear from her work that Julie combines her training in all three mediums to brilliant effect. One of her many abilities is to take everyday objects, combine them with her passion for the natural world and create another beautiful and thoughtful work of art. Can anyone forget those beautiful long gloves <laughs> uh, embroidered with images of seaweed at the 2019 exhibition at Craft ACT? The list of her exhibitions, awards, residencies, representations in collecting institutions and grants reads like a who's who of cultural institutions in Australia and overseas. This evening, we will learn of another residency here at the National Library. Julie will speak for approximately 45 minutes. This will leave time for some questions. Please wait for the microphone if you do have a question. If you, are, if you have a question via Zoom for those online, please use the Q&A function on your screen. Please join me in welcoming Julie Ryder. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, that we meet here tonight on the lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. I also acknowledge any First Nations people here tonight. My talk tonight focuses on the embroidered maps in the National Library of Australia's collection. But firstly, I would like to give you some background about my arts practice and how and why I came to study these maps. Towards the end of the talk, I will show you how they inspired my current body of work in boundaries at the Craft ACT Gallery. <clears throat> I've been a professional textile designer and artist for over 30 years. I originally trained in science and worked in veterinary and hospital laboratories in Australia and overseas. In the late 80s, I returned to Australia from the UK and retrained as a textile designer in Melbourne, eventually starting my own business, printing textiles for fashion and homewares. I moved to Canberra in the late 90s and completed a master's degree in visual arts in textiles at the ANU in 2004. My master's research was on the use of bacteria and moulds in the surface design and coloration of textiles. And part of my practical work was conducted at the ANU Botany Laboratories as well as the scanning electron microscopy laboratories in the Research School of Botanical Sciences. This merging of art and science, and indeed looking at different ways of seeing and interpreting information, is a key theme that runs through my practice. Since then, I've had a successful career as an um, 
My arts practice encompasses both my love of science and art. I have worked as an artist in residence with many scientific and cult cultural institutions over the years who have trusted me to delve deep into their archives for inspiration. These include the Australian National Botanic Gardens, CSIRO, the National Museum of Australia, in order to research their collections to develop new bodies of work for exhibition. My purpose in developing these exhibitions is threefold. One, to bring public awareness to the research undertaken within scientific institutions. Two, to discover and tell new stories about objects within cultural institutions that help us to discover the past and inform the future. And three, to engage new audiences with both science, history and my own arts practice. Now I see familiar faces in the audience and some of you are familiar with my work, but for those of you that aren't, I'd like to share a small portion of um, the way I work. With art and the bryophyte, I explored the history of botany and the role of cryptogams in the origin of terrestrial plants. With transgenesis, I explored our fears surrounding genetic en engineering of our foodstuffs. In Generate, the genealogy of Charles Darwin and his marriage to his first cousin Emma and Victorian life was compared to the indigenous peoples he visited during his voyage in the Beagle. And more recently, The Hidden Sex explored the role of women botanical collectors in the 19th century through research on pressed seaweed albums. This last exhibition, an extensive period of research at the National Museum of Australia, furthered my interest in the lives of women of the 18th and 19th centuries, what their hobbies and pastimes were, what their social, academic, professional and even sartorial restrictions were, and what it meant to be confronted by gender inequity and contested space. Last year, I was selected as a craft ACT artist in residence in partnership with the ACT Parks and Conservation. This residency was initiated back in 2006 and comprises both a residency component and a research component. The, the selected artists reside in Namaji National Park in a Hudson's ready-cut cottage in Gudjanby for a number of weeks. The research partner is one of Canberra's cultural or scientific in institutions, and this changes every year. So last year, the research partner was the National Library of Australia, and artists were in, required to engage with the MAP collection. The two other artists chosen for this residency were ceramic artist Bev Hogg from Canberra and Mel Robson from Alice Springs. Our submissions for this residency had to identify why we wanted to research the map collection, what maps in particular we wanted to look at, and how we thought this research could inform a new body of work for exhibition the following year in the Craft ACT Gallery and Civic. So since 2006, I've used dyes extracted from plants growing at particular sites to make textiles that reflect a specific time and place. In 2013, as part of the Canberra centenary, I chose two sites in Canberra that had personal meaning for me, but were also culturally significant for the Indigenous uh, First Nations people, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri. These sites were Pialigo and Black Mountain. 
Over the course of the year, I selected plants that were growing in both sites over the four seasons and dyed cloths that then became a map of that site. These cloths were further embellished with the contour lines from the topographic map of the sites where I picked those plants. In another piece made for this exhibition, I sourced the 1909 survey map of the ACT made by Charles Scrivener and embroidered it onto an old damask tablecloth that belonged to my grandmother who had been born in that same year. This work speaks about several significant issues. The white on white embroidery represents that this map is a white man's map. It's carving up the land to suit a particular need. The tablecloth with its indelible stains from decades of meals and cups of tea was then submerged in the mud of Lake Burley Griffin to get the staining on the bottom. This represented the uh, history of white settlement of this area. I thought about the flooding of the Malonglo and wondered how on earth women of that time in their pise floored huts could manage to keep anything clean, much less white. It also represented the damming of the river to form the lake, which in turn submerged an historical hunting and food gathering site for Aboriginal people at Yarramundi Reach, where this photo was taken. So I started thinking about my submission for the National Library residency. And at the time, I was reading a book called Threads of Life by Claire Hunter, an English textile practitioner. One of the chapters was entitled Place, that talked about naturally dying textiles from local plants, about the many different stitches that could be used to embroider cloth, and the close association between embroidery and the land, actually very similar to what I'd been doing myself for the last two decades. Claire stated, we call the cloth we embroider on the ground and the thread that travels through it makes stitches like footprints, leaving its mark as the needle pushes on from one place to the next. When I read that sentence, the correlation between textile and land was cemented for me. The chapter went on to explore embroidered maps through history and the women who made them in both Great Britain and America. I quickly consulted the NLA catalogue, and yes, there were three embroidered maps in their collection. Suddenly I knew how and what I wanted to explore in that residency, and I knew that at some point I was actually going to embroider my own experience of Namadji. Claire Hunter's information <clears throat> on embroidered maps relied heavily on the research done by Judith Tyner, Professor Emerita of Geography at California State University. Tyner had taught geography for over 35 years and had a particular interest in embroidered maps and globes. She's many, written many articles, papers and books on the subject, including Stitching the World, Embroidered Maps and Women's Geographical Education. And this became a key resource for me to understand the maps I had viewed at the NLA. In fact, at this point, I need to correct myself and talk instead about embroidered map samplers, because this gives us an important clue as to how they originated. I'm also only going to focus on uh, map, textile maps made in England rather than the United States because this is where most of um, the embroidered maps that we have in our, our Australian collections originated from. So the word sampler comes from the Latin exemplar meaning example. 
and stitch samplers have been recorded in history as far back as the 1400s. They were made as a personal reference to record stitch patterns, borders and decorative effects that were used to embellish clothing and household items. Samplers depicting alphabets and numerals were worked by girls as young as five to learn the basic needlework skills needed to operate the family household and they often doubled as educational tools. In the 18th century, British women's education, oh, excuse me, for working class girls, functional stitch, stitchery such as the darning sampler here and the alphabet sampler provided them with a means to earn a living. Their stitches formed monogram, monograms sewn on sheets and other household items, as well as personal garments to identify the household washing in communal laundries. Sewing, both plain and decorative, extended the life of garments through darning, mending, alterations and embellishments, essential for life in a new colony where fabric was scarce. Towards the end of the 18th century, printed textiles became available and more affordable, so samplers became less instructional and more about social and educational accomplishments. In the 18th century, British women's education existed predominantly to prepare a girl for marriage and focused on social accomplishments such as needlework and dancing, conversational French, drawing and painting, and lessons of reading, writing, and basic arithmetic. Girls had lessons at home, taught by their mothers or tutors, while some attended boarding schools, dame school, or in the case of orphans, charity or Quaker schools. In the latter half of the 18th century, girls began to access a more academic education in both Europe and America, and geography became the first science to be included in the curriculum. One of the proponents for geographic education in England was Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather. He believed geography should be taught at an early age and that children should be able to find the counties and name the counties of England. From the 1770s, stitched mat samplers gained in popularity and female students as young as six practiced geography and developed artistic skills by drawing and painting maps, as well as embroidering them on cotton, silk, linen, wool and satin. Most of these were copied from existing printed maps, either drawn freehand or by using a pantograph. Head teachers often drew the map out themselves and then the girls copied the map from that. And this is evidenced by maps made by girls at the same schools. Maps were also printed in women's periodicals and these could be taken out of that periodical and used with the um, prick and pounce method, which is probably why so many of them um, have not survived. Towards the end of the 18th century, map printers began to issue maps printed directly onto silk, ready for embroidery. Um, the first of these were printed by Lorian Whittle from Fleet Street in London uh, around 19... Uh, 1797. So one of the earliest embroidered maps in the NLA collection is this map of the world, according to the latest discoveries, and it was completed on the 3rd of June 1783 by an S. Barwick. As we can see, it's a double, double hemisphered map showing the latest geographic uh, discoveries and reflecting European knowledge of the world in the late 18th century. 
The map measures about 45 centimetres by 72 centimetres and it's framed behind glass. The title and the maker's details are in cartouches and the ground of the map is silk satin embroidered with a silk thread. <clears throat> the border and the coordinate grids are stitched in black and national and regional boundaries are in a pastel palettes of blues, browns, greens, pinks and reds. North and south are stitched into the poles of both hemispheres. In many ways, this is also a pictorial map because at the four corners, we see embroideries of the indigenous peoples of Europe, Asia, Africa and America as vignettes. This was a practice on drawn and printed maps as far back as the 15th century and was imitated on many map samplers. In 1783, we see that Australia appears as New Holland with Tasmania or Van Diemen's Land attached to the mainland. The northwest coast of North America is recognizably modern though with a distorted Alaska, predating the findings of Cook's third voyage and no sign of a southern continent. The United States is not named as its independence was not recognised until the Treaty of Paris the following year. This is almost certainly made by a wealthy English girl, possibly made as part of her formal education. This is evidenced by the expensive silk ground and the silk threads. Now, I did try, but I couldn't find out how much um, a bit of silk fabric cost in the 18th century. But um, according to Tyner, Lorraine Whittle pre-printed -pre map onto silk cost seven shillings and sixpence. And having just read Jane Eyre, we know that um, a, a governess's wage was between 20 and 30 pounds for the year. So that kind of puts it in context. I want to show you some similar maps from other collections just so we can compare and contrast approaches by each maker. So this is another very similar map um, from, it's from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Again, it's British. It looks very similar to the one in the NLA um, collection, but it's in, in, in extremely poor condition where the silk has completely shattered. The cartouche wording is slightly different. The polar circles are identified and the islands of Vanuatu or Spiritu Santu um, also appear. Silk shattering is often caused by the chemicals used in the manufacturing process. Some of the chemicals that they used were tin or iron salts and they were bonded to the silk fibre. They added weight as well as volume and shape. And as silks were sold by weight, this was a lucrative ploy sometimes to overcharge the buyer. However, as the silk fibres aged under dry conditions, the salts embedded within the, within the fibres acted as miniature razors, causing the silk to deteriorate and shatter like glass. Here's another very similar map of the world from the latest discoveries by Mary Ann Wood. This had been up for auction from the George Glazer Gallery in New York and has since been sold. It's most certainly a British map and the auctioneer has dated it between 1790 and 1815. Looking at the similarities between it and the previous two maps, perhaps it could be dated much earlier. This map also shows another trend we're going to see, and that is the stitched tracks 
of Cook's Voyages. Cook's voyages occurred between the years of 1768 and 1779. So it's interesting that our earlier maps of 1783 don't include those tracks. This map is in the collection of the Te Papa Museum in New Zealand. And we can see the similarities with the other maps. However, instead of the maker's name being embroidered on the front, in the lower cartouche, we see an elaborate compass rose stitched instead. The reverse of the map bears the ins inscription, worked by Anne Margaret Hammond in the year of our Lord, 1812. Again, this is a map stitched in black silk on a silk ground with highlights in red, blue and gold. This map features the tracks of three of Cook's voyages across the Pacific and you can see them in the really tiny stitching there. Embroidered map samplers were also produced as single hemispheres. And here are a pair that are in the collection of the National Museum of Australia. On the left is the Western Hemisphere and on the right is the Northern hemisphere, Eastern Hemisphere. They're embroidered in black and coloured silk threads and the route of Captain Cook's three voyages to the Pacific are indicated in black running stitch. These maps show the evidence of being pinned out and stretched and they would have been framed and displayed in the home, in the parlour probably, as was the custom to show off the virtues of the maker. And I also wanted to show you this sample of the Western Hemisphere showing the voyages of James Cook, but this one is attributed to have been stitched by Elizabeth Cook herself. It's in the collection of the State Library of New South Wales, but prior to that, it had been in the Australian National Maritime Museum. It was found amongst Mrs Cook's possessions in her home in Clapham in uh, when she died in 1835. So it hasn't got her signature on it, but it was with her possessions. Now, interestingly, Judith Tyner in her book states, it is said to have been stitched around 1800, and at that time, Elizabeth would have been 58 years old. And while it is possible she made the map, it is questionable. Now, I wonder if Tyner knew about the embroidered tarpa cloth waistcoat panels that was also found amongst Elizabeth's belongings. These were to have been finished for Cook to wear to court following his triumphant return from his third voyage. Made from tarpa cloth, gifted to her from her husband on, on his second voyage, these panels are exquisitely embroidered in silk. And to my eye, the composition and rendering of the leaves in particular appear to be done by the same hand. The second embroidered map in the NLA collection is described as a large embroidery sampler map of the world showing geographical features discovered on Captain Cook's voyage. Now this description is one of the cataloguer and not on the map itself. Again, it's a double hemisphere map, but it has no cartouche and compared to the first map that we saw, it's quite plain. The silk ground is a matte weave and very plain rather than the lustrous satin weave. The embroidery is done predominantly in black with lettering in cross stitch. This map does not look as though it was printed first and then stitched because the cross stitch allows us to see the gaps between the crosses forming the letters under high magnification. It is estimated to have been made in the 1790s. 
We can see that it had the maker's first name and perhaps even the date embroidered onto the silk ground, but at some stage this has been deliberately removed, leaving the, leaving the backing cloth showing through. The surname remaining on the backing fabric is Western. This has either been printed in black ink or embroidered onto the backing cotton. Was this a ploy to pretend the map was made by somebody else as a family heirloom? Maybe we'll never know. What is interesting about this map is although Australia and Tasmania are still connected as one landmass, the mainland is now subdivided into Lewins land, DeWitt's land, and South End, New South Wales, with the names of Port Jackson, Botany Bay, Morton, Cape Morton and Northumberland Isles. Many more islands and places across the globe have been depicted in accordance with that exploration. The Sandwich Isles, Society Islands, New Hebrides, New Caledonia, the Friendly Isles and Tierra del Fuego to name a few. Now I'd just like to show you one more map from the Cooper Hewitt collection acquired in 19... 75 that's also dated to the um, 1790s. It's a silk and metallic embroidery thread on a plain weave silk ground. This map resembles the pictorial type double hemisphere maps we've seen earlier on. However, look at the mass of information in the tiny, tiny stitching contained within it. I believe this map was made by somebody less interested in embroidery, but absolutely fascinated with history and geography. We can see that little attempt has been made to embellish the four pictorial representations of the indigenous peoples of Asia, Africa, Europe or America, besides some rudimentary stitches over the original drawing. Whilst the central spray of flowers is beautifully worked in coloured silks. It seems that once the maker got started on naming places on the globe and tracks of discovery, this was their passion. Apart from the overload of place names dexterously embroidered in black, we can now see that Tasmania has been liberated from the mainland of Australia following the the discoveries of Bass and Flinders in 1798. So one of the first maps that was printed onto paper did not depict this until 1802. So perhaps this embroidered map was made after that date. <clears throat> During my brief time at the NLA, I also looked broadly at historical maps of Canberra and the Namadji area and read widely about the early settlers and who made Namadji their home. I also discovered some other interesting textile maps that had been printed or embroidered, including this map of Antarctica, made in 1907 by Miss Taylor. This map of McMurdo Sound shows the expedition made by her brother, the explorer Thomas Griffith Taylor. It was part of a tablecloth used in the Antarctic hut on the Scott ex Expedition 1911 to 1913, which I find quite fascinating that a tablecloth would be taken, taken along on an exploration when the focus would have been on trying to keep their gear and personal belongings to a minimum apart from essentials. Um, so this is just a portion of the tablecloth that the NLA has. Another surprising find in the map collection was this American attaché case from 1984 that contained a tactile graphics kit and instructions for making maps for the site impaired. I was immediately inspired by the idea of making maps that depicted ephemeral, or unseen events. 
So now I'd like to share with you some images of the work that I produced as a result of this.